you're listening to episode 186 of the Tennis Files podcast on how to think, train, and compete to your potential with special guest, Bo Trays. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode. This is Mirabon and I'm back with an interview for you with coach Bo Trays. He is the author of How to Tennis, Think, Train, and Compete to Your Potential. Bo played Division I college tennis at the University of Nebraska in North Florida, and then he went on to play on the professional tour where he achieved a world ranking, and then he went on to coach ATP pro Brandon Nakashima, and uh, he currently is now coaching pro Patrick Kipson. And on the show, we talk about a lot of great concepts from uh, analyzing data and applying it to your matches to of course, relatedly, the proper strategies that you should employ to do better in your matches and how to properly practice to get the most out of your potential. So we hit on a, a great range of topics that I think will really help you just get the best out of uh, what you can in your career. And I, I think you'll really enjoy it. So let's just uh, get straight into the episode. So. Without further ado, here is my interview with Coach Bo Trays. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Tennis Falls Podcast. It's a pleasure to have Bo Trays on the podcast. I've seen a lot of his great work, and he's actually the author of a new and fantastic book called How to Tennis, Think, Train, and Compete to Your Potential, which is really what we're all about here at Tennis Falls, trying to help players improve their game. So I thought it would be fantastic to get Bo on the show. Um, so Bo, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for coming on and I really appreciate your time today. Yeah. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you about everything. Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've seen you on uh, different podcasts. I was actually listening to one of you from last year and you've been on my uh, friend uh, Phil Fama's shows. And so, yeah, yep. it's, it's been great to see uh, you drop a nudge. And so I wanted you to do the same on this show rather <laughs> selfishly. Um, so, so yeah, you know, I've, I, you're, you're a great player and coach and I just wanted to, 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 kind of start and see how you uh, got your start in tennis because that can often be pretty interesting to see how how that happens for the guests yeah yeah uh from way back you mean first first time yeah first time you touched a racket pretty much yeah my uh my dad was a coach um and so there's pictures of me you know as a baby with a uh, he used to have me like in the in the tennis pro shop you know basically with a string hanging down from the ceiling and like a racket in between my legs, me just banging the ball. So it's pretty much, it's been forever. Uh, I've got an older brother who's uh, eight, nine years older than me. And uh, so, you know, I was basically would go to school and then go to the tennis courts with him and my dad. And uh, you know, there's pictures of, of me in like a, a backpack while my dad would be hitting with my brother or giving my brother lessons. So I was kind of like a, I kind of grew up at the courts and I, where I lived in New York, um, we had a court in our backyard. So, you know, it was always me and the cousins and, you know, buddies just playing when I was a little kid. So it's really been my entire life. I've been playing. Um, I didn't really turn that competitive until probably I was like 12. Um, mm. yeah, I played a bunch of other sports too. I loved all the team sports and, um, you know, but when I was 10, we moved from New York to Florida. And so tennis was easier. It was more year round. Um, and so I kind of just started getting into, into tennis a little bit more than everything else. Very cool, man. Very cool. Um, yeah. 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 It's, it's, uh, it, you know, just kind of random, but like, I don't know how long you, you were in New York, but aren't the courts there like really expensive? So it's really good that you had that court by you, right? Like, aren't they like over a yeah. hundred an hour? I, I don't know. I mean, I don't really remember because I was so young, but I know that like, yeah, I mean, you got to pay for court time and then, you know, I mean, lucky that my dad is a coach, but you got to pay court time and lessons and all that kind of stuff really adds up. And, and, uh, like that's where my brother, you know, he grew up in New York, uh, playing like his whole life. Cause I have an older brother and sister and we moved to Florida once they went to college. Uh, but like, I, I remember for him, it's always tough. You can only really get a court in the afternoon and like, you know, all that kind of stuff. Whereas in Florida, like I was hitting before school and after school. And mm. if I had a break during school, I would go and hit all that kind of stuff. It's just so much easier. Um, so yeah, yeah, I was, I was pretty lucky. I think for my tennis development that we moved to Florida. 
Yeah, for sure, man. And, and so as far as um, your junior career, at what point is was it that you started to get uh, serious and, you know, and then like what type of training environment did you shift to when that happened? Yeah, I, I probably, I mean, I'm a pretty competitive guy. I think most, most tennis players are. So I think I was probably always taking it pretty seriously. Um, but I didn't really start thinking about it probably until I was like 14. I mean, I was always playing, you know, I would play a lot of tournaments, probably like two or three a month, but I didn't really, like I was a kid. I wasn't really thinking about rankings. I wasn't really thinking about like, am I going to go pro? Am I going to go to Ken? And, you know, my dad is the only coach I've ever had. So, uh, you know, it was, it was always pretty, pretty cool between the two of us. And I just kind of go and practice with him. And, um, you know, it was kind of, it was pretty low key, I would say compared to, you know, the world that now I kind of see from the coaching side, you know, the way that juniors are playing now, I, I was nothing like that for sure. Gotcha. You know, uh, I, I was not really that, obs- I, I didn't really think about my ranking. I didn't really think about winning, you know, this tournament so that I can play that tournament kind of thing. I was just playing and, you know, obviously trying to get better and all of the, all of the right things, but I wasn't really like, that I wasn't like hyper, like this is going to make me number one in the world. Yeah, isn't that kind of an advantage? Cause I feel like a lot of players like myself, you know, in the juniors, I was, I feel like I was too focused on the rankings and that would kind of make me, you know, not train as, as well as I should. Like I wasn't thinking long-term. I was just thinking about, uh, whatever I could do to, you know, win the point. So, I mean, do you feel like that was an advantage for you in some ways? Um, I never really thought about it, but I, I think with my personality, yeah, you know, because I'm pretty much, I'm pretty like, if I can get the skills, then I know I can win, you know, and like, if I could, if I could just improve, then I'll, I'll have the level kind of thing. So I think probably, yeah, I mean, my dad didn't really stress it. My, I mean, my mom certainly didn't stress what my ranking, ranking was. I mean, if I was enjoying it and, you know, I was giving like a full effort, I mean, that was kind of always the thing for, for us, or at least the way I was raised is, you know, you, you work hard at what you're going to try to do and you give a good effort. And, you know, it was always very clear to me, like, you're very lucky to play a sport, you know, you're, yeah. I mean, come on, it, it is a game, you know, and, and I was always reminded of that, and, you know, it teaches you discipline and all that kind of stuff. And that's, that's more where I came from with it. And then it just sort of, you know, obviously I'm a good player and stuff. So that kind of took off and then add competitive on top. So you want to be good. Um, but yeah, I, I was never really, caught up in the rankings that much and i think given who i am yeah that was probably best i i don't think i would have really responded to you know i gotta be this ranking or you gotta be that ranking i mean even when i was in college i I just don't really think like that you know because you know you know what level you need to be able to play at to get where you want to go and then you know you can go point chasing and stuff like that but if you don't have the level you get exposed at some point and i mean to, to me, it's just more like if you have the level, great, but you don't want to just get points and then not be getting any better, you know? Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent, man. And, and yeah. as far as, um, your junior development, you know, that's obviously a very important <laughs> time for everybody. Uh, you know, what, what you, what, how you train then can impact your technique and so forth years down the line. So if you were to be able to somehow, you know, with a time machine or something like that, talk to your, your junior self at like maybe 14 or 13, like what type of advice would you give yourself, uh, so that you could maybe maximize your chances of being able to like succeed on the, on the pro tour? Yeah. I mean, I, I think about that a lot. I mean, I, I really would have worked so much more on my serve and return. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just the, the entry point into every next level, you know, whether you're going from juniors to college or college to futures and futures to challengers. It, you know, if you, if you can't return 130 mile an hour serve, well, you won't be a pro. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You just, you can't, you know, and, and I, I didn't work on my return really that much at all. I mean, I did it a lot for doubles, but that's such a sort of a specific return, you know, where you're probably going to be a bit closer to the baseline, short backswing, block it, cross and, and kind of go after that. And I was really good at that. I mean, I was much better doubles player than singles player, but I never really worked on my, on my singles returns and kind of just understanding how that starts the point. Um, so, I mean, that's it. That's probably the, a huge thing that I focus on with the guys that I coach now is the return. What are you trying to do? 
obviously with the technique of the swing, but like, how does that set you up for the point? I mean, it's just an area of the game I never really thought about. You know, I was always thinking about, personally, I was thinking about transitioning forward. I mean, I have good hands, a one-handed backhand, so I slice a lot, that kind of thing. How can I get to the net? But I really should have focused on the serve and return. I mean, having good mechanics on your serve is huge just mm-hmm. because, you know, my whole thing, and it's in the book, is, is you know, playing your equal. You know, and at some point you get to a level, no matter how good you are, that everybody's your equal, you know, and, and your forehand doesn't get you free points anymore and your serve's no longer massive. And, you know, being able to serve up to a point, so many players that are, you know, pro, pro players who aren't really any, anything special off the ground, but they can serve. And that makes, that makes them have a career and other guys not, you know? Yeah, man, for sure. Um, you know, trying to frame this in terms of like, uh, amateur club players, I think, you know, majority of the listeners are probably three, five to four or five players. Um, yeah. what, what's your advice on what to work on? Cause I think there's the dichotomy, obviously like that, the, between strategy, uh, yeah. Placement strategy, uh, those two and then technique. So what's your advice on, on players on, uh, what they should focus on be- for cl- uh, for club players between uh, technique or uh, strategy and placement. Yeah, I would I would lean more towards the strategy and placement side, um, just because I feel like technique kind of you never really stop refining the technique. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Even even pro guys are still tweaking with technique a little bit here and there, but I feel like understanding the strategy and and what your strengths are and how they can, that can generally fit into a game plan to me would be the biggest thing just because, you know, then you're clear out there and you're not second guessing, you know, the short ball, where do you hit the approach or what should you do if you're at 30 all, or, you know, maybe should you serve and volley at 40 love to mix it up and, and get in your opponent's head a little bit, things like that. I feel like could really help a club player kind of just add more to their game. You know, maybe every now and then, if you're up in the score, you take a second serve return and come in behind it just because now you planted in the opponent's head that you're coming forward and they can't just count on you to be on the baseline, you know, things like that. I don't, I don't know. It's been a long time since I've coached at that level, but I feel like when I was there kind of in college or something, you don't, you just don't see that very often. You know, I feel like people are kind of stuck playing one game, you know, and if you can figure out plan a on somebody, you'll probably be all right. You know, and and if you could have a decent plan A and plan B and maybe mix those together, to me, that would be huge, you know. Um, but I think I think everybody's different, you know, probably is the, is the right answer that some people should should probably focus more on technique. Some people probably more on strategy. Yeah, sure. That makes a lot of sense, bro. And, you know, I was, I'm just curious, you, you mentioned that even the best players in the world, pro- professional players, they are still tinkering with technique. Like what are some of those little things that they're even they are working on? Yeah. I mean, I I think some, some guys, for example, like let's just say generally on on a forehand, you know, I think some guys, because we're all pretty whippy with the forehand, you know, we can all create so much um, racket head speed Mm -hmm. that sometimes the technique of the forehand can get a, a little bit away from you you know, especially if you put on the years and years of doing it. And so kind of refining and, and getting the spacing right with your right elbow away from the, away from your body so that you can hit a ball more pure straight. You know, I mean, a lot of times, I don't know if, the, I don't know who exactly hits it a lot. Right. But sometimes like if, let's say you're coming into a forehand, it's when you hit it down the line, it'll kind of curve left, you know, as a righty. And, and it'll curve right as a lefty. But if you can get that ball to actually go true straight, that's a better ball, you know? And, and so keeping that elbow away usually will help get that done. And, you know, if you feel like maybe that's happening to you, you'll work on something like that, you know, just, just minor things or maybe pronating a little bit more on the serve to get a little bit more weight into that serve, a little bit more pop, you know, not nothing major, but, you know, as you're, especially as the coach and you're with this guy all the time, you can really see like, Hey, if we could do this and this a little bit better, you would be better, you know? And then you can ask him if it's a decision that he's making to do that, or if he's trying to do the right thing and just can't. And then maybe you, you refine the technique a little bit, but, um, usually it's just, in my opinion, it's just small things like that. Um, 
you know, and, and a lot of guys like to feel good, you know, and so they just want to be fed, fed balls for a while so that the stroke feels right, you know, and so you can do that, you know, I mean, everybody, like I just said, every, everybody's a little bit different, but I think there's, there's definitely people out there who just, if their technique feels right, they play better, you know, and, and I think that's, that's massive to keep them feeling good and, and playing well. Yeah. Yeah. And no, a super interesting insight there, but I appreciate that. Um, so how does a player balance, you know, chasing rankings and trying to get a good ranking and all that with developing their game for the long term? How do you balance that out? As a, as a junior? Well, yeah, I'm glad you asked the clarifying question. Um, you know what, for the purposes of the podcast, let's go with, uh, and like a 4.0 NTRP rated player, and their you know their goal is that they they really want to get to 5.0 um, gradually, but then you know you want yeah. to balance those two. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I would I would say you know I always am probably going to come from the from the space of like if you don't have the skills to to repeatedly play the same level day in and day out, there's really no reason to like try to get up to that level just to only be pushed back. Mm. You know, so I would, I would say really making sure that you have the skills first. Um, but then, you know, there is, there's a large part of it where the more you play and hopefully you start winning, the more confident you get and you, your game kind of can go to that next level. Even if you don't necessarily make any huge technical or strategic change, you just kind of get used to playing a little bit more. You kind of find your rhythm and all of a sudden, six months later, you're just a, a better, more confident player, you know? And you're understanding how to manage, you know, your nerves or being tentative or whatever you might be, you know, dealing with. I think playing really helps helps you figure those things out a lot more than practicing does. Just because so many players are are a, a very high level in practice, and then on the match court they drop because they get tight or they're just nervous or whatever it is. You know, so there's a lot that you got to just play through, in my opinion. Yeah. And I mean, th that's one of the biggest uh, problems and emails that I get, you know, people asking like, oh, how can I, uh, why do I play bad in matches when I play great in practices? So uh, any particular tips uh, on, you know, how, how to change the training up to be able to actually perform, you know, as well as you do in practices or close? Yeah. I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge, a huge proponent of, you know, practicing what you play like you know, and, and figuring out what your strengths are and, and hammering that, you know, like I don't really think that you need to hit forehands cross court for 30 minutes out of an hour practice because that just doesn't happen in matches, right. you know, but maybe you could work on serve in the first ball, you know, or maybe like take a backhand down the line, they play it cross and you handle that kind of sitter forehand and you actually attack it and get the footwork right and and rep that out for 45 minutes because that's really a play that happens you know i feel like when you practice what really happens in the matches you you're clear and you know what's going to come and you do that and and maybe you struggle with it not to say that you're always going to get it right but at least you know you know that you're struggling with what matters you know i i just see so many players getting frustrated on a practice court hitting forehands cross and you're just thinking like dude this isn't even a real scenario <laughs> And now you're frustrated and then now today's whole practice is down the drain for no reason other than you just didn't really think about how to organize your practice. You know, um, I really wish that that's another thing I wish I would have done when I was younger is just practicing set plays, you know, and, and even just understanding what set plays are. You know, I mean, if you watch any of the best players, you can pretty much call it on a dime what they're going to do once, you know, if you watch them a lot, maybe I'm, I'm, on the on the uh, outskirts of I'm an outlier of how many people you know watch matches, but you know someone like Sitsipas. I mean, you could predict what Sitsipas is going to do just based on the score, and he nearly every time he does it. But you know, you know, Michael Jordan's going to get open. He's still going to score. You know, mm -hmm. the, like that's kind of how it is. And I feel like if people had that mindset of like I'm going to do this, and then whether it works or not, you can you know make the adjustments that you need to make after the match. But you know definitely coming in with a plan and practicing that plan, you'll be confident. Yeah. You yeah. know, but if, if you wait till three, all 30, all to hit your first slice approach, like that's trouble. Mm. Yeah. Big you trouble. <laughs> big trouble. Got to yeah. practice, you know, uh, got to be comfortable, have that comfortability level with what you're going to implement out there. Um, 
Yeah. Bo, so I've heard you talk about the term performing what wins the most points. So could you kind of clarify what that means and then how we actually do that? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, at the pro level, you can watch matches and see, you know, recurring patterns of, of shots that actually pay off, you know, and then so the pros, they can practice that shot. Um, so that's, that's what I spend a lot of time doing and, and watching the film to see what the guy is good at. And then we, we practice that shot, you know, like for example, uh, the player right now, and if you go kick backhand, you, he used to kind of go back and start the point middle, you know, but that would get him in trouble. Mm. And, and so now he's taking him a lot earlier and he's really hammering him and he's, you know, pretty much right away on offense. And so there you switch the dynamic of all those ad points that get started with a kick backhand, which is a lot of them. And all of a sudden you're kind of a different player, you know? So, but you don't, you don't get better at that dealing with a kick backhand return by practicing your volleys. <laughs> you know, you, you got to hammer that, that one shot for a while. You know, I mean, every practice multiple times throughout the practice, we'll work on that one shot and then maybe even the next ball too. You know, because you can you can see how it'll go. Um, you know, I, I don't know exactly at the three the three five level what that would be, um, but I think if if the player you know is aware of what they're trying to do and aware of their own game, maybe your your inside out forehand is your best shot. Kind of having someone feed you that ball, and then maybe dealing with a little bit shorter one that you got to move forward to. You know, because some of those like short balls that just kind of die and land short. Sometimes those are really tricky, you know, and you don't really see those in practice if you don't make that happen. But, you know, you can certainly make that happen. You just have to, you know, allot the time to that. Yeah, for sure. Um, this, um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, another thing I was going to say is just thinking about maybe like the the most successful type of passing shot, you know, is the, is the second passing shot, you know? So training that habit, in practice of making the first pass. So you, as soon as you see that you're going to have to pass, your target is just the player. And obviously, you know, you want to keep it low, but that, that habit of making the first pass, then track down the second one and just rep that, rep that, rep that, rep that. Cause that happens a lot. That happens a lot more than, you know, missing the, the 12th ball of a rally, you know? So it's just to me, again, that's one way that you can change your practice time and maybe spend, half of your time, especially when you get closer to tournaments, hitting passes. I mean, how often do you really practice hitting a passing shot and then digging out of the corner to get back and track down the next one? You know, I mean, maybe, maybe people do, but, uh, from, from what I've seen, I feel like that's just an under, an underutilized time in the practice court, you know? Yeah, Bo. Uh, and, you know, it's it's really fantastic to hear you speak, as you can tell the the passion and how much you've been uh, studying the game. And I'm I'm curious, you know, how um how did you develop this passion for studying the game? Because as you mentioned, like with the film, it's not uh, a huge percentage of people that are are studying to this degree. So how did you get that uh, that passion for it? Yeah, uh, when I was when I was playing. Um I was, you know, I'm pretty good. I had a few points, mm -hmm. um, but I tore my bicep and I was injured and, and I was playing on my own money. You know, I would go to the country clubs in New York uh, during the summers of college and, and teach and make money. And then I would use that money to go play. Uh, so, you know, the realities of minor league tennis got real quick. You know, uh, it's very expensive to play. And when you're losing, especially at futures, you're making no money. And so, at some point, you know, you're really thinking like, okay, well, I can afford to play seven more tournaments. Mm. And, you know, that, that's pretty uh, humbling. And so either way, when I got injured, um, I couldn't really do anything. And so I thought, you know, how am I going to spend my time? You know, and there's only so much running and, you know, working out that you can really do. And so I thought, okay, I'll just start watching matches. And I, I didn't really have anything in mind when I started. You know, I, I was just kind of like, this must be the second best thing I could do to play, you know? And then I sort of started watching and kind of these patterns just honestly, they just kind of like came into my head uh, and I started tracking where literally every shot landed in a match. Mm. And so every time the ball landed, I would hit pause and I would mark it down on a section of the court. And it started really rough like that, where I would just do that. And, you know, if you do that for a you know three out of five set match, that's hours, 
you know, of just sitting there and watching and thinking. And, you know, then I started tracking where do balls land at 30 all? And what about add in and add out? And how do guys play different scenarios? And so I started watching, you know, I'm personally about six feet tall with a one-handed back end. So I would watch guys like that. So mm. Tommy Haas, Sitsipas, Simon Bolelli, uh, Dimitrov. Obviously, those guys are the best. But, you know, if you go and you watch Challenger, Challenger videos, some of them are really good. But sometimes the quality is so grainy that, like, it's tough. So I would watch the ATP matches a lot. Um, and just kind of would see, like, okay, when he's serving. And then what is he doing at 30 all when he's returning? And then what's he doing at game point? And there's, there's patterns, you know, these guys are smart. Um, and, and so then it, it really just evolved to me once I felt like I was figuring something out. I mean, I was watching a few matches a day. Uh, I mean, I still watch tennis every day looking for, for different things. I mean, right now I'm watching a ton of Dan Evans, you know, he won uh, Melbourne, Melbourne one, I think. Mm -hmm. And you can see very clearly how he manages risk, you know, and, and, Rublev. I mean, Rublev is as predictable kind of as they come. I hate to say that on video. I don't want that to haunt me, but he is, and he's good at it, you know, and he's, he's hard to stop. But, um, and I think it really came from a place for me of like, okay, if I'm going to play, you know, tennis for my living, I need to know what's, what's going on. I need to absolutely know what is my plan? What are these guys plans? Like, how do they adjust? Do they adjust? You know, because I, I just felt like so often, you know, you you would lose a match in college. Nobody told me anything. And then after I lose the match, the coach would say something like, well, you should have made a come. You should have made him come in more. Or you should have come in more. Something just very vague. Yeah. And you're like, you're a little bit like, well, dude, if you knew that while the match was going on, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and and the thing is now, you know, I feel like I can make adjustments during matches and and that's what you see on tv so often especially in three out of five of a guy really making an adjustment and you really have to know what was what were you what are you trying to do at the outset of the match is it working is it not working and what should you adjust to you know what i mean and that really is the level that those guys are thinking at so that was for me just a way of of trying to do whatever i could to try to compete with with the highest level player i could you know so it, it kind of it came from a need and a, and a desire to start winning more. You know, uh, I just, I couldn't be playing. And so I had film to watch. That was the next best thing. Um, and, and, you know, it really just kind of, it, it changed everything about the way I think about the game. Honestly, it changed my practices. It changed how I play. It changed how I coach. Um, it changed everything for me, but I probably did that for man, probably a year and a half. Hmm. Uh, I was injured for a long time and, and wanted to keep playing, but, um, yeah, the, the watching, watching film was huge for me. That's amazing. I mean, what were a couple of the biggest revelations? Like, you know, after that session of like two hours or so, uh, tracking what, you know, where, where the, like, what patterns did you see? Like, you know, on 30 all they do this, that, that you were like, wow, I need to do this as well. Yeah. I mean, the, the biggest thing that I see the biggest thing that probably shocked me was, you know, let's just say you're, you're, there's two righties playing, mm -hmm. right? And one guy is, is taken off the court to his forehand side. You know, I was always taught that when you're on defense, play cross court. You know, it's mm -hmm. the longer part of the court. It's the shorter part of the net. Play cross. And, and that's not wrong. It happens for sure. And I definitely coach that. It's right. But very, very often, they're going to take that ball line. They're going to play the ball high and heavy line. And, and this is why I think that, that they do that is because the court's shorter, right? So you don't have to hit it as far to get it deep mm. because so often you try to go cross on a running forehand, you leave it short. The guy takes a forehand line and you're, you're done, you know? And so then you, you take it line. It can land deeper with the same shot, the same trajectory lands deeper and it's the player's backhand. And I will take, somebody trying to come in and take an, uh, uh, a high backhand cross over a, over a high forehand line, you know, and, and you play to the weaker side. You know, that's the, the other thing that I really found was like in the big moments, these guys are playing to the weaker side and that's it. <laughs> I mean, if you watch, if you watch Novak and you know, watch him at 30 all, he's going to play to the backhand mm -hmm. until he gets one that he's going to try and change. I mean, that's what he did to Francis a few days ago. 
on on most big points. He's playing backhand, and then he'll slice line to Francis's forehand, and and that's how it goes. And that's where the the you get the mini break and the breaker, and you win the two breakers, and that's it. You know, I mean the the margins are so small with these guys. I mean, obviously Novak and those guys are incredible, um, but in terms of ball striking, they can lose to anybody. I mean, Fritz just took him to five. Mm-hmm. Francis won a set off of him. Um, you know, Nick and and team absolute buster in the fifth. Yeah. Um, who went? Kokonakis and Tsitsipas went five. Mm-hmm. I mean, the level is so close. You know that maybe you make a few more of these decisions to play to play line on a on a running forehand with shape, and then you know bust it back go with, instead of an offensive forehand. Maybe he misses that backhand, and you win the point that you would have lost. And you do that a few times inside of a point inside of a match that you know relies on eight points sometimes, maybe less, and that's that's the difference. You know. Um, so to me, those, those two things were huge, you know, because it's just counter to what I had always been taught, you know, and, and I watched a ton of, a ton of matches of mismatches. So like I would watch how Tommy Haas plays, you know, whatever first round of Hamburg when he plays a guy who's 80, who's obviously very good, but like Tommy should win that, Mm -hmm. you know, or, or these types of matches and they play so safe so safe against these guys and they beat them with the weight of their shot and the consistency of the decision making they, they don't walk out there and hit every line and then you know go have a coffee you know and, and that's kind of what you think you know you think like well dimitrov must just blast forehands against guys who he's better than and you know what i found was that he actually is going to play a little bit safer against the guys that he's better than and and just absolutely wear them down over the course of the match and, you know, against Rafa, he's going to have to redline a little bit, you know, but, but I always kind of thought it was the other way around and maybe I'm alone in thinking that, but, you know, so far it, it has proven that, uh, I wasn't alone in thinking, you know, every shot goes to the corners when really it doesn't, you know? Yeah. Um, really great stuff. I'm really enjoying hearing your insights and yeah, it, you know, it, it's interesting because I, I just, I interviewed Marcus Willis last week and, you know, as you know, he made that sick run at Wimbledon and he ended up uh, going through pre-qualifying and qualifying and uh, first round victory and then played Federer. Um, yeah. And like he, what he said that surprised him too was basically the same thing. Like with, when he played Roger, like he said, Roger really didn't do anything like specially didn't go for like crazy shots or, you know, on the, the, the lines and all that, just kind of basic tennis and, you know, but he was yeah. good at it. And that's, that's how he, how he won. Um, so yeah, very cool stuff. And, and also really revelatory, maybe that's not even a word, but <laughs> you know, the forehand line, I really like that how, um, cause you're, you're not only forcing the opponent to hit a backhand, but like usually it's going to be a, a running backhand for them as well. Um, and so with that yeah. Sh- shot, yeah, just to clarify, um, w- like, because I, I feel like a lot of players, like, maybe they'll go line, uh, at least at the club level, but they'll, like, just try to go for broke type of shot. So well, at, the, at the level that you're yeah. looking at, I mean, they are, like, amazing and can hit these ridiculous shots, but is it usually, like, a running, right. like, more loopy, heavy ball that's, like, higher yeah. margin? Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's the same thing, like, high and heavy. Yeah. But you just change it to the weaker side. And, and maybe the forehand is the weaker side, right? So then maybe cross is the better option. Mm-hmm. But I, w- I mean, I just think it's a good change up, you know. And, and yeah. for sure, when you're, running, when you're running forehand and you just slap it line looking for a winner, that, that's not what I'm talking about. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, back to what you said, like how can you practice these things? Like practice that. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, practice making that decision on defense. Okay. What shape am I going to give the ball? Am I going to play to the weaker side or the stronger side? What do I have to recover like? All those things, you know, that because that is what tennis is. You know, tennis is not making 85 standstill backhands cross in a row and hoping that the technique is right. You yeah. know, I mean, in the top 100, there's a million different techniques. As long as it doesn't injure you, it's probably fine. Yeah, for sure. You know? Yeah, yeah, definitely, man. And, and when you uh, when you watch those mismatches, you said like Haas versus the number eighty that he should be winning. Like, wh- um, how did the losing player get beat? Or, well, actually, I'll flip it. Like, how, what mistakes were they making that that you found like really put them in a hole? Yeah, I mean, a lot of mistakes when the player is on offense. Mm. You know, giving trying to do too much and and 
you know, in, that's what I talk about a ton in the book is that most past the, I think, of course, I forget it right now, but you know, you're going to have a winning, a winning percentage when you are the one who approaches the net. Right. So I did this whole thing where I was tracking where passing shots went. Right. So if they went line or cross, because one thing we've always hear is cover the line, you know, right. Right. And, and I've also found that not to be true. You got to cover mm. cross. Most passing shots go cross because mm. the low part of the net, they want to dip it at your feet. And with the rackets and the strength that these guys have now, that's, that's what happens. You know, cover the line, in my opinion, is, is just wrong. Uh, but that's maybe a conversation for another day. Um, but uh, you know, when, you, when you make your opponent hit a pass, you're going to win that point. You know, I think it's something like 68 or 73% of the time, something like that, very high. You know, and, and the way that I was tracking it was that they actually had a shot at the pass. So if they're wide open hitting a slice forehand, that doesn't count because that's just a knockoff volley. But like really decently set and can hit the pass, you mm. know. Um, so the, the thing that I've seen is like, you know, the, the worst player or, you know, the, the, the guy who's supposed to lose would just kind of overcook a lot of approach shots and miss so many approach shots when it's like if you just break it down into math you're better off, you know, bunting the ball into the court and hoping that you make either a good value or misses the pass than missing the pass. And that's very simple. But I think if you think about the math equation of that, you know, at, while you're with the one playing, you take some pressure off of yourself. Like it doesn't have to be a slice line that goes an inch over the net and lands an inch inside the sideline to be good enough. You know, it, you just got to, if the guy's on the run and he's hitting a pass, it's a tough ball. And if he makes them for the next two hours, too good. But most of the time, he's not going to make them, you know. And and the other the other part that I think really helps too on that is that, especially early on in the match or in sort of the first tight moment, if you hit a good approach and get passed, you know that only four percent of passing shots on the first time get hit for a winner. Mm. So if that happens, it's a miracle. <laughs> so you can quickly get it out of your head. It uh, doesn't matter. Too good. You know, rather than dwell on it and say, uh, this is why I never come to the net or, you know, he's too good or whatever it is, because it's just statistically, that's not true. You know, and at least for the way that I think it's, it's much easier to move on when I know that that's the case. You know, it's easier to put it out of my mind after a blistering backhand pass for a winner that, okay, well, that doesn't really happen. You know, and, it, and that happens significantly less as the stakes of the match go up, you know what I mean? Um, so, so that was probably the biggest thing that I've, that I saw, you know I mean? Of course, mm -hmm. sometimes there's differences in the quality of your ball, but you know, that's tough. Sometimes Dimitrov or Haas, they just serve bigger and better than the guy that they're playing. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of unfair, but like in terms of when they're both equal, you know, it's it's who takes care of the offensive opportunities that they get that usually makes a big, big difference. Very nice. But yeah, I'm, I'm really enjoying this, the stats uh, analysis here. Um, and by the way, the stats, like, is that, I assume that's like a, you know, based on like a, a crap ton of matches or something like that? Like, how... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's just a, t a ton of, that's all those matches that I was watching, just writing uh -huh. it down. I mean, I have notebooks full of... <laughs> Uh, you know, it looks like hieroglyphics a little bit, but, <laughs> yeah. but I can understand it and, and uh, you know, convey the information. So, so it works for me. Very cool, man. Very cool. Um, kudos yeah. for doing that. Uh, so yeah. uh, as far as the approach shot, um, I, I know you mentioned, uh, obviously we, we don't want to, it's really bad if we miss it. Um, do you have any, uh, a, like approaches that's a pun there, but of like how to decide like where to hit the approach shot? Is there like a best location or anything like that that we should think about? I mean, you know, just generally speaking, the backhand is usually the worst side mm -hmm. and you're going to have a better winning percentage against a backhand pass than you do a forehand pass. Mm -hmm. So I would say, especially if you're playing an opponent that you don't really know and you're just kind of feeling it out in the beginning, I would, I would just play to the weaker side. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't really think that much about approaching like line or cross, especially in the beginning of a match. I just think put him on his worst side or put her to her worst side and see what she can do there and, and adjust off of that, you know, and, the, and that's just my way of thinking too. 
that goes back to like, okay, at least I have a base plan, you know, and, and then I can see what happens, know what happened and adjust, you know? So maybe if I go backhand cross pass uh, approach and they can, they burn me three times down the line, maybe I'll take the next one down the line and see what the forehand can do or whatever it is, you know, but I, I like to just operate on just what is the math of, of, you know, obviously I'm always talking about pro tennis. So I, I don't know, honestly, if it translates, I imagine it probably would, but just basing off of that of, okay, let me start with what I know is right and adjust off of that. I, I think sometimes people get a little bit complicated thinking about like chat and, and how deep and all that kind of stuff where they think it's just put them in a tough spot to his weaker side and see what they can do there. Yeah, I think that applies even more <laughs> so at the uh, the three five to four five level and so forth, because uh, you know it's it's going to be a weaker, uh, probably a much weaker shot than in the pros, uh, relatively speaking, and all that. Um, so, Bo, as far as like um, uh, numbers on the serve, do you have any particular uh, illuminating numbers in terms of like? Oh, you know, like you'll win the point the most if you slice out wide, you know, on the deuce side or something like mm. that. Like any particular stats that are pretty noteworthy? Honestly, I don't. I, okay. I don't. I, I do feel like the serve is a shot that's pretty different for everybody. You know, I think guys certainly have a better feel for this and that serve. You know, mm. some guys slider wide is nasty. And so mm-hmm. they're going to hit that more often. And Gotcha. No, I, I really didn't find anything that that mind blowing about the serve. You know, everybody just has their own go tos, and and I think that's where like you really got to know the guy. So like, if you're gonna watch a lot of your opponent, just watching the big points. Where do they serve at thirty all? Where do they serve when they're down break point? And and trying to catch on to trends there. But I didn't find anything sort of overarching that that you know is is worth anything. Yeah, no, I got you, man. I'd, I'm actually really curious about, um, you know, the, your process for kind of writing the book and when exactly did you do it too? Because like you mentioned, obviously you, you started watching all these matches, taking a, a ton of notes. So the walk us through, um, you know, what at one what exact point did you decide, like, I want to write a book? Uh, so the inspiration and then what you did after. Yeah, um, you know, I, I've always, I've been a pretty big note taker and like, I always kept a journal, you know, when I was playing in, in college and stuff of how my game is, how my head is, you know, whatever, just not just everything. Um, didn't really have anything behind it. Um, and then when I sort of started playing, I kind of like found recurring themes, you know, that I was consistently writing about or writing about in my game of like, these things keep happening and what's going on. Um, so once once then I got injured and, and started finding out all these, these statistics and these way, these ideas of training that I had just never thought about or heard of before. Um, I thought like, man, <laughs> this would have been great to have when I was playing, you know? And, and so I kind of thought like, okay, you know, I like coaching. Maybe I'm going to be, maybe I'm going to coach, but you know, I would want to help as many people as I can, you know? And, and I think if you're only telling the people that you actually coach, you know, the information, it's kind of limiting, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, the things in the, in the book are, are theories of how to practice and what to practice and why, and, and how to probably control your mind in different scenarios and things like that. It's very general. I think, I think it can help a lot of people, but it's not like, this is how you beat him and this is how you beat her. And you know what I mean? It's not specific like that. So I, I felt like, you know, if I had had this book when I was in high school, I think I would have turned out to be a significantly better player. You know, and if I had had this book when I was playing futures, even, uh, I think I would have been a much better player. And so I probably started it, I would say, you know, probably like three years ago, um, started thinking like, Hey, maybe I could put all this together. And, you know, I did a podcast just like you do with guys on the road and it was called, what do you get? And I would just do it with guys at tournaments and, you know, the, the futures level of tennis challenger level. And, you know, why are you out here? What are you trying to do? And so I always, love talking to people and, and kind of hearing their opinions and their takes on things. And so I thought, you know, writing is right up my alley. Um, and it just kind of evolved from there, you know, and then when I finally did start coaching, you know, I, I was just thinking like, man, it would be really nice if I could just give 
the guy that I'm working with something that he would like know what I think like, and we could get on the same page quicker. Um, and it just kind of mor- morphed into a book. Honestly, I, I didn't like start out with some plan to write a book. Um, but as I, you know, looked through my notes and thought about the game and what am I trying to do, you know, in tennis, it just kind of made sense, you know, and, um, now, I mean, I've sold a, a ton of copies of it and, you know, it's, it's been great. I've gotten a lot of good responses from it. So it's, it means the world to me, uh, that it, that you can help people. And, and I think that's the, the cool part about it is that it really is just like a way to help people. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people in the, in the world who play tennis who just don't have the information that, you know, they need or that they, you can't afford a private coach every day. And maybe you can't even afford a lesson, but if you can buy the book, I mean, you could, there's tons of, of drills and charts and, and diagrams in the book that will feed up, you know, as many, as many hours on the court as you want, really. I mean, it's kind of endless. So I just felt like that would be a cool thing to, to add to the game, you know, um, but it really, it really came together now once, once COVID hit, cause I had a lot more time I could sit and think and edit and, you know, all that kind of stuff took a while. Um, but yeah, probably the last year and a half, I really buckled down and wanted to get it done, but I would say, I, you know, started it with, you know, writing in the, in the notebooks and stuff, probably, you know, three years, something like that. Pretty neat, man. It's it's really uh, must feel great that you uh, have it out there. And yeah, I mean, books are just amazing because, you know, it's just like a usually like a lifetime of information, and you're just paying you know a few bucks for it. So it's always, uh, you know, I I try to tell myself to never really hesitate if I'm interested in a book. Um, and we'll link to uh, yeah. to your book in the show notes for sure, so everybody can just click and get it. Uh, and again, it's how to tennis. That'd be great. Yeah, for sure, man. Uh, how to tennis, think, train, and compete to your potential. Uh, curious too. I mean, that's really awesome that you uh, that you had a podcast on the road. I bet you got a lot of great information from from your fellow athletes. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you would ask them why they're out there. Uh, just curious, like, what were some of the main reasons uh, why they were out there? You know, d- considering how tough it is. Yeah, I mean, a lot of guys just wanted to see where they could get to. You know, and that was the thing that like really. In, endeared me to the sport and and just the fellow competitors honestly is that you know when you you don't really talk about those things very often you know especially if you're at a tournament like you're not going to talk to some other guy in the draw that you don't really know about like hey man tell me what tennis means to you like you, <laughs> that doesn't come up you know right, right. and so it was cool it was cool just to like hear the the personal stories of it and most guys i feel like are just you know trying to be their best and and trying to make their dream come true. You know, I, I, it's, it's pretty much as simple as that. I feel from my, from my, uh, podcast. And that's one thing that I like so much about coaching is that, you know, you really do get to help someone make their dream come true. And, and I mean, in my opinion, like what's better than that really. Um, but it was, it was a lot of that. Um, a, you know, a lot of guys at the futures level too, they, they want to see the world. You know, you get to travel and play at all these different countries and cities and experience so many different cultures. And I mean, that's stuff not many people get to do, you know. And so if you get to compete and, you know, make some money and, and try your hand at the professional sports at the same time, I mean, it's a pretty sweet gig, you know. Um, so it was, just, it was just cool to hear hear their take on it, you know. And, and it was a fun way for me to get to know people and, and spend my time because there's a ton of downtime, you know, you're – in the gym and on the court, but then you're, you're tired and, you know, you can sit behind a computer and edit the clips together and do all that. So yeah, it was, it was cool. I mean, I, I loved it. I loved it. Awesome, man. Awesome. In terms of, um, futures players versus the challenger level players, uh, what, what, uh, what things do you think separate those two levels uh, from each other? I think mentality is, is a huge part of it. You know, um, the challenger guys, they, they hesitate less on mm-hmm. court. You know, they, they know what they're going to do and they're going to do that and they're going to do it well. And I think that's something you could look through every level and, and point to, you know, these, these guys hesitate less. It's the same thing you feel when you go from challengers to ATPs that they're just the, the ATP guys are just on you from the, from the moment the point starts they're on top of you and they don't second guess. And, you know, so that's a huge thing. 
Um, and then I, th- I think a large barrier of it is the serve and return. You know, uh, they just they're, they're more used to seeing that kind of serve. They're more used to serving that well. You know, I mean, once you've played just like any level, you know, at just a higher level for a while, you get used to a certain standard, you know, and, and in future sometimes, especially if you're, you know, very good and you're winning a lot, you can get away with things that you couldn't get away with at an ATP level, you know, and, and then you kind of, you get your shot up there and you get exposed to something better and you're just not used to it, you know, and, and the serve and return is huge. I mean, like you just, I hate the saying that you can't miss. I hate that. But, you know, if you look at challengers and ATPs and stuff like you can't miss second serve returns, you know, and, and that's just something where if you go to a future first round of two guys that are, you know, 1500 and that's who I was. So I feel free to, to talk about it. You're definitely missing second serve return, <laughs> you know, and, and it's just a, maybe it's mental. You're just not locked in enough, or maybe you haven't practiced it enough and you don't understand the scoring situations, but you know, just little, little things like that can make a huge difference in the, in the outcome, especially, you know, when you're, when you're both equal players and you're both very good. If one guy is a little bit more on it, making first serves at, at add in and one guy is missing second serve returns, maybe that's where the match, you know, the score turns. Um, so those things I, I think really make a difference. And then, you know, the, the a big thing too is just the quality of the ball. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever been to a futures or if you've ever been to like a, an ATP, but if you watch those, those guys practice, like they hit the ball so pure and with so much weight on it that, you know, they can play you right through the middle of the court and still beat you because their ball is so good. You know, I think it's, it's very similar. You know, if I go out and play, you know, a high school player who's pretty good, I don't need to do that much because I hit a better ball than him. I don't really need to take any risks. I'm going to eventually just break him down, you know, and I, and I feel like that's one thing that happens, you know, from ATP to future level guys too, you know, and, and I saw it, you know, in, in all the film of watching, you know, Dimitrov play a guy who's 200 in the world playing him off the weight of his ball, you know, and, and not managing, I mean, not taking risks and making the, the you know, worst player, which is a strong word, but go for risks off of a tough shot. And, you know, whether, if you hit that for three hours, great. And most of the time you don't. Yeah. So is it basically that like the weaker player, I mean, even though like they're, they should be able to do like the same, like, you know, basic tennis at like well, I mentioned when like, you know, Willis, Marcus Willis played Federer. He said, it, you know, he's doing basic things like I guess the, the weaker player just feels like they're more pressure to come up with something really good. Is that like a kind of a fair assessment or is there more? To yeah. It? OK. Yeah, okay. I think that's fair. I mean, I, th- I think that's very fair. You know, you just feel like you got to do more. And the moment you feel like you really got to do more you start redlining and you know, then it's just a matter of how, how long can you maintain that level? And most, for most guys, it's, it's not long enough. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's kind of yeah. a little bit of a, of a switch in topic, but I'm curious, you know, cause the serve is such a big part of everybody's game. Are there any particular serve techniques that, uh, you know, maybe you've worked on, uh, or, you know, part of your serve technique, um, or maybe a, a that you've worked on with a player that you found could be a really helpful tip for, for our players to improve their serve. Yeah. Um, I mean, I I really think that getting the ball toss right is huge. Um, you know, especially if, if your ball toss varies a lot. I mean, I, I think working like legitimately as boring as that sounds, making sure that you can toss into the same spot every time so that you're actually, taking the same swing at the ball um you know that that to me is huge i like to kind of keep it you know kind of like right out in front of my left eye Mm. probably is how i think about it when i'm tossing so that you know i'm getting my body into the ball and extending and all those things um another trick um you know especially on a kick really pronating with your wrist at the top to Mm. to to generate that force on the ball you know that's something I I don't know how much people really work on that because I know a lot of people get arm injuries and all those types of things. Um, But I would say just generally probably those two things working on the pronation, you know, because a good kick, I mean, at every level, I feel like having a good kick, even on your worst day, you can start the point kick backhand and you're probably going to be okay. You know, and, and there's nothing worse than having a a bad serving day and, and feeling like the guy is just abusing your second serve. 
and you're playing everything from behind and it, it's a horrible feeling mentally to know like, man, I can't buy a first serve and my second serve sucks. You know, so I think developing a good kick is huge. Um, yeah, that would probably be my, my tips there. Gotcha. Gotcha. Awesome. Um, you know, I think, uh, as, as we talked about a little bit, you know, players just don't really watch enough, uh, film. They don't film themselves enough to, to analyze their own game. Uh, what tips do you have for players in terms of how, and and you're a pro at this basically, I mean, what, what's some, what are some tips you have on how to really get the most out of analyzing film? So let's say we have a match film of ourselves or an opponent, like how should we approach watching it and taking notes, et cetera, to be able to, to get a lot out of that session? Yeah. I mean, personally, I think, you know, the, the best strategy is to be playing offense, you know, in tennis. I mean, I don't really want to be a guy who's going to make a career hitting passing shots, you Mm -hmm. know? So I think if you just wanted to like start very basically, you know, I would look at the points, you know, the, the more important points of the match. So, you know, obviously that depends on the score, but maybe the 30 alls, um, you know, when you're serving and returning and the ad points and and see kind of how you played them. And do you think you played them with the intent to play offense or did you kind of play them too passive? Did you play them defensive? Um, and then I would look at, you know, the first, first two shots of those points. Like, did you return, let you down and you just left a sitting duck in the middle of the court at 30 all, you know, and then that's pretty clear if that's happening over and over, you got to work on your return. Um, or maybe, you know, like I said earlier, are you getting offense, but then missing the approach shot, you know, and then, you know, maybe work on the approach shot or are you missing the volley? You know, that, that's where I would look just because I think, you know, there's a, from the mental side of tennis, I think being able to play offense is huge knowing, okay, I can actually win this match. I I don't need uh, the opponent to have a bad day. I don't need miraculous lobs, you know, in the tiebreaker to help me win. I think that's a very empowering feeling. Um, And I also think you, you relax a lot as a player. If early on in the match, I like to do it early on, but you know, whenever, if you, you make a good offensive move and you, you knock off a crisp volley, you know, you kind of feel like, okay, let's go. I'm, I'm in it now. Let's do it. You know, something like that to me is just a mental side of it where it's like it can kind of get you going a little bit rather than, you know, playing the first five games a little tentative and sort of feeling it out. Like, go, play, you know. Mm. Um, so, so that's what I would say if you're just kind of starting out. I would look at, you know, the scoring scenarios and how you play and match that up with how would you ideally play. You know, because it's very different to have a coffee and think, yeah, man, play offense at 30 all. That's definitely what I'm going to do. And then you get out there and you're tight. and You don't want to miss. Uh, you know, that definitely happens to everybody. So I think, you know, figuring those out and trying to match those two up and then, you know, looking at just the execution side of like, OK, what's what's my good shots? What's my bad shots? What's letting me down? And then, you know, you get to work on those. Um, that would be kind of my my first reaction to like, okay, you know, I don't want to watch four hours of film, but if I had, you know, 45 minutes to watch something, what should I watch for? I would say, how do you manage the opportunities for offense? Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. Um, or or I would say maybe just as valid to, uh, to flip that. How do you manage, you know, when you're down in the score, you know, if you're facing break point, do you always try to go for a huge serve and miss it and end up getting stuck having to hit a second serve? You know, and then maybe you, you consider serving differently on break points or something like that. You know, those, those different scoring scenarios are just so big and, and how you play them. It's not more important than, you know, having good technique, but it's certainly every bit as important. And I just feel like people probably, it's easier to look at like your forehand and, and see that you didn't drop your wrist or your elbows this way, that way. It's, it's harder to think like, okay, what was I thinking? What was I trying to do? What would be the best thing to do? But in my opinion, that's that's where you know some of the differences are made. You know, it's just different level of, of thought, probably. Yeah, yeah, and it you know it doesn't come easy. It uh, you know it takes forced practice uh, or a lot of practice. I I remember you know like I felt like I was never really a I don't know how to describe it, but like 
I'd have like, you know, my coach to be able to like think about how the points are constructed and, and my other friend who was pretty good at that. But I felt like, you know, I'm never really thinking this way, but it's really impactful when you can uh, start to think, you know, like a, a chess player and, and the moves you're planning and what's working and what isn't. I think this is really like a mindset shift that players have to make. Uh, and it's going to really yeah. help them uh, a lot. Uh, Bo, do you have like a, a system for deciding when to play an offensive shot versus a defensive shot? Like, I don't know if you do you break the court down in any particular way to make it easier to to decide like when that happens. You know, I don't. I mean, I've I've seen um, a layout of the court where it's like a red light, yellow light, green light. Yeah. Have you seen that? Mm-hmm. I've seen that. I don't necess- I don't really think about it like that. Um, you know, I, I think, um, you gotta, nah, I, I don't really, I mean, one thing that I definitely spend a lot of time on is, is thinking not so much about like what your shot is, you know, let's say I'm playing my shot and, and how my shot felt, but more so what it did to my opponent. You know, there's a lot of a lot of opportunities, at least at the level of tennis that I'm coaching, where, you know, you get a guy stretched out hitting a slice and like you're on the baseline just because you think he's there or you think it wasn't a great shot, whereas that ball just floated over the middle. You know, and if you had been watching him a little bit more, you would have recognized this guy's running for his life. Mm. I could sneak in and grab a volley. And even if he hits a good, you know, a good dig. Uh, I can probably still handle a volley to the open court or something, you know? So I think a lot of players kind of get an offensive shot and they think only about themselves. I want to hit this ball hard. I want to hit it right there. I want to, all those things where it's like, maybe instead of thinking about me, I'm going to think, okay, I want to get him stretched out to his backhand. So whatever that means, given that ball, that's what I'm going to do. Maybe you go with a backhand angle approach instead of an inside out because you can actually get it off the court better with your backhand angle Mm -hmm. and that's playing more for position and more for what am i going to do to him more so than like what do i want to do and i think most guys would rather just absolutely crush a forehand inside out but maybe that's not the best choice you know um so i i don't think too much about zones like you know red light green light uh yellow light um I do think that's super helpful though. I think it definitely clarifies the court and it's a, it's a pretty simple way to say offense, defense, neutral. I think it's great for that. Um, but no, I, I don't really have any, any way of breaking down the court uh, that I necessarily coach or, or think about, you know, I think you have your, your good shots and that's what I think about like, you know, watching film of like, you know, maybe one guy's backhand down the line is particularly good. It's his strength. So maybe he's looking to hit that shot a little bit more often than someone who doesn't have that weapon would be, you know, but, um, yeah, there, I don't have any like hard and fast rules of when you're here, you do this, when you're there, you do that. Yeah. No, I think that makes sense. Cause there, as you just mentioned, you know, there's other variables as well. You know, you have to really be paying attention to, uh, to your opponent and, you know, their, their balance and, and how they're, how they look, uh, in terms of, you know, how ready they are to recover. So, uh, I, I think it, you know, that, like you said, that system can help, can be like a baseline, but there's a lot of other things to consider, especially at the, uh, the pro level here. Um, you mentioned in an interview uh, as well that uh, it's really important to learn where your strike zone is. Uh, so I was wondering if you could kind of talk about that a little bit as well. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you when you're playing um, or practicing, you know, recognizing and being aware of, like, where do you hit good balls from? You know, where on your body, where is your strike, your strike zone? You know, if you think about it, like in baseball, all those guys know exactly what pitch they're looking for. You know, and, and I think the same thing is true of tennis. You know, it's it, if you're, you know, in a forehand cross rally and you're, you're, you want to change line, don't necessarily just change on any ball, you know, because they're all different. And maybe you, you handle a high ball better than you handle a low ball. So maybe you could be at a point where you're playing and you're just registering, you know, hey, here's a low ball. Okay, I'm going cross. As simple as that. You just base it off of where is the ball going to be on my body more so than like, what do I want to do? You know, um, but that's that's definitely one thing I, I talk about all the time with, with my guys is like when it's in your strike zone, it's right to take it, regardless of whether or not you just missed four in a row. I mean, obviously, you know, make adjustments if you're hitting three in a row in the net, give it a little bit of shape, whatever. 
but you know, you, you got to play offense, you know, and that's, that's where I come from. So if you get a strike zone ball, man, take it because if you don't, he's gonna, but if you don't get a strike zone ball, have the discipline to not take it. You know, I, I think that that's the ball recognition part of it and, and really being tuned in to, to what you're good at and what that ball presents you with and making a sound decision off of that. You know, I mean, I think that's one thing that, you know, makes somebody like, you know, um, Monfi or Kyrgios or Jack Sox so, so good is that their strike zone is basically anything. <laughs> you know, I mean, they can do so much with the ball that they can, they can take a ball that most of us don't see any options with and do something great with it. You know, that's a, that's a special talent that those guys have. Um, and they're certainly aware of that. You know, they're not just out there doing whatever they feel like doing. They know they can do that and they practice it, you know, and, and then that's why they can do that. But I mean, if you think it like Dominic team, like I feel like he's very disciplined with his shot selection based on where the ball is. He, he's very, very disciplined and he doesn't go for that much very often, but he does. But, you know, most of the time it's right. I mean, people love his backhand line. Most of the backhand line that he takes are somewhere in between his, you know, like uh, his waist and his, and his chest. Mm. You know, he's not just pulling it out of nowhere. And, and that's the thing I think people get, you know, off track with is they think they got to take a ball from their shoelaces and, and hit this unbelievable angle where it's like the, the top pros really don't do that, you know. Maybe, maybe they do it, you know, once a match on the run and it's 40 love or something, but that's not the difference between being an ATP player and being a futures player, you know? So I think practicing that and being aware of like, okay, here comes a chest high volley, a chest high forehand. I can read the flight of the ball. It's go time. That's a very simple way to make your decisions. And, you know, I think when you're really playing and competing, it should be as simple as as you can make it really so that you can just go and let your, let your instincts kind of take over. Yeah. I love that. Bo. I mean, I, thinking about uh, when I was playing my best tennis, I felt like I was just really getting the ball or hitting the ball in, in my strike zone uh, as, as much as possible uh, adjusting my footwork so I could do that. And then obviously, you know, when it wasn't in that strike zone, then uh, not going for as big of a, you know, powerful shot, let's say, um, you know, I think naturally uh, the audience, uh, they're going to ask, you know, for, for three out of five of players, let's say, like, where, how do, how do we find our strike zone? So how do we find it? Yeah, I think you find it by, you know, A, figuring out what is what is your strength, you know? So let's just, let's just stick with your forehand down the line is, is a shot that you like to hit. You think it's a good shot. You know, so when you're practicing, you know, I have a, uh, I love to do this drill, but you set up two balls to make a little window down on the backhand side of the other side of the court. And you, you know, you hit forehands cross or through the middle looking just for that strike zone ball to take down through that window, you know? And so you go until you hit 10 and maybe you can adjust it. Okay. Now I'm going to try to take balls down the line that are above my shoulder and just see how those go for a little bit. Maybe you're really good at that and you never try it. So you don't know you know, or, or maybe you're horrible at it. <laughs> so you learn, Hey dude, it took me two hours to get 10 through the window. I can't do that shot. So, you know, you know, I, I think you have to practice, you know, recognizing and then taking those shots, whatever your good shot is, you know, that's one thing, like you don't really hit any mindless shots in a match. You know, most shots, even if you're staying neutral, you, you chose to be neutral, you know, and so I think you have to practice like that. You have to practice conscious decision making and you have every every bit of sense to to practice offense, defense and neutral and just registering those balls, you know? So so practice your your forehand cross angle and your forehand line and see where where do you generate that shot best, you know? Love that. Awesome. Awesome advice there, bro. So, uh just one tip on the mental game. Uh what maybe one or two best pieces of advice have you ever either gotten from somebody or given to somebody in terms of uh, mindset and the mental game that you think could really help uh, club players? Yeah. Uh, on, on my podcast, actually, I got a gem from Amir Delic. I don't know mm. if you know him, Yeah. Uh -huh. um, yeah. but he told me that there was a point in time where he was really struggling mentally and he was losing a lot and he was having a hard time. And, um, 
someone told him, you know, how, how good do you think you are at tennis? And he said, you know, very good. I'm very good. And so he said, so to beat you, you would have to be very, very good, at least as good as you are. You, you know everything about tennis and this guy knows just as much. And he said, yeah. And so she's, you know, so whoever it was that was telling him was like, think about that. This person is a, is a genius at tennis. If you're a genius, then they have to be too. So, you know, literally giving them credit, just, you know, when they hit a good shot, wow, good shot. And, and actually meaning it, you know, and that once he told me that, I started doing it and I really found myself, A, not saying it that much. So it kind of made me think like, okay, most matches are winnable. Guys aren't wiping the floor with me. But then when I would say it, like it would register in my head of like, damn, that was a good shot. Like, that was cool. Like, not, not, I probably wasn't so calm to think like, wow, that was cool in the time. But like, it really helped me just give genuine credit to your opponent that to beat me, you got it good, you know? And, and that really helped me a lot just to, to say and mean good ball. You know, it's nothing more than that, but good shot, something like that, you know? And, and, that really helped me a lot. Um, mm. So I would definitely, I would definitely recommend that, you know, being just being more kind of genuine and, and giving the opponent credit when it's due and not always taking it. Like I did something wrong. Maybe they played great. Maybe that was a great shot and you did everything right. And that's too good. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's probably the one tip I have about, you know, the, dealing with something like that and the competitive side of it, that, that really helped me a ton. Yeah, I love that one. Um, yeah, it's uh, you know you get a lot of players who they they demand perfection of themselves, and you know we all know that you know the best player in the world is winning like what fifty five percent or something like that of yeah. the po total points, and so we're not machines. And yeah, I mean the other aspect is just kind of treating yourself uh, like you would a friend instead of like a piece of <laughs> junk. You know, I feel like too many people For are sure. just like bashing themselves in and out. Uh, so that's, that's really good. Good stuff there. For sure. Um, yeah, For sure. man. Yeah, and man. the self-talk of it is so huge. <laughs> the yeah. self-talk of tennis is, is enormous. I mean, you just couldn't be, couldn't be more important really. Yeah, definitely. Uh, what, what types of, um, self-talk are you telling yourself in between points? I mean, I try to do my best to, to fill my mind with, with plans. Like I, I like mm. to have a plan and, and that way, I'm focused on, on a strategy and B like thinking more. So if, if I notice that I'm getting maybe a little bit negative about this and that I switch, I try to switch it as, as soon as I recognize and, and go back to what am I good at? What is he bad at? How can I make those two things match up? Um, but at, at the same time, it, it, it's not like, you know, you're, I'm immune to ever being like, dude, my backhand sucks. I mean, I definitely feel that. And I've said that, you know, a lot. Um, Me too. But I think the, the quicker you can recognize it and get out of it is is the biggest. And, and I try to think that I'm going to win, you know, thinking about winning, you know, and because I think very much so like what you tell yourself comes true sometimes. And so tell yourself you're going to win because you're gonna, if you're not telling yourself you're going to win, you're telling yourself what? You're going to tie or lose. Right. So you're telling yourself something, you know. And I, I just think if you can spin it to be as positive as you can and as realistic as you can, <clears throat> I think that's the, the biggest thing. You know, I'm, I'm not a huge like, you know, you have to be this super positive, like, come on on every point and like only positive because I feel like sometimes that it's a little cheesy, like it's not real, you know, um, I think as real as you can be. And for me, that's usually like, OK, reset to a strategy, reset to a plan and and just play if you come out on top today awesome if you come out on on the bottom side of it well that's what you agreed to do anyway that's right that's right great stuff there man yeah. great stuff yeah um so in terms of um you know how to tennis think train and compete to your potential um like who would you say the book is most well suited to in terms of the audience like who would benefit the most from it you know, I think anybody really looking to make a breakthrough of a to a different level of their game, you know, it, it's not a technical book, but it's a very strategic book and a book based on, you know, the percentages that I've found on the ATP tour, which are I would feel confident to say pretty much 
going to be up and down the levels similar, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, So I feel like people who are maybe a little bit feel stagnant in either a, their practice or B just their style of play. And they can't really figure out like how to add new dimensions to their game. Um, I think it would be really good for that. Um, as well as just the mind, the mindset of playing, you know, and, and how to deal with different scoring scenarios and, and different situations when you're winning and losing. Um, I, I think it would really help there, you know, um, but it's not, there's no techniques in it. There's no like 10 tips to hit a better forehand or anything like that. Um, but I, I really feel like the strategy side will make things very clear and will let you know what other players are doing to you. You know, um, that there's, there's probably not a magic sauce that they have. You probably just don't really know what's really happening in the, in the game. You know, like one of the, one of the stats I found was amazing to me was, you know, I was watching for, but I was checking for how many winners are hit, you know, and if you, you turn on ESPN tonight and watch the Aussie, you know, whoever's playing Sitsipas is going to hit. I don't know, 42 winners over the course of four sets tonight against somebody. But, you know, there's a huge difference between, you know, having a wide open court. You work the point for six balls, a wide open court, and you knock the volley off versus being in the middle of a a three ball rally. Everybody's standing in the middle and some guy just blasts a backhand winner, you know, and, and I call that a ready opponent, you know, and if you watch tennis and you look for how many times does a ball get hit past a ready opponent who's, relatively in the court you can kind of predict where the next ball is going to go everything's okay it's like four times in a match max mm. so that really changed my mind too these these winner and unforced error numbers in my opinion really skew things the way that people understand it if you know great players it skews it for a lot of pro players but especially if you're only watching when a grand slam comes on tv and you hear these guys are hitting 60 winners and then you go out to your courts and you hit one you're like, well, what am I doing wrong? I need to go for the lines more. But that's not really the case. And I would say the same thing with unforced errors. You know, I think, you know, if, if you agree that you want to play offense, then you agree that you're going to have shots that you could have played inside the court and you're going to hit them in outside the court because you're going to take risks. And it's not, in my opinion, just putting balls in play is not the way to make a career. You know, and so if you agree to, to go for it, you agree to miss even easy balls. You're going to miss them, but you have to agree to that, you know, mentally and in your game plan before you even get on the court so that it doesn't eat you alive. You know, I mean, you're going to, you're going to make poor decisions, but it's a game of decision-making. I've never seen anybody just go and hit every ball to the center of the court and win a match, you know? So at some point you're going to have to take the risks and, you know, differentiating that winners and unforced errors and what that, what does that really mean? To me, that's a big one. That's huge. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, obviously your book, uh, it doesn't need any technique in it to help players to really advance, you know, uh, several levels because a lot of times it's the difference makers are just the choices we're making and where we hit the ball and, uh, you know, our, our, our just our approaches on, on, you know, different situations. And, uh, it's great because strategy, it's something where, you know, you can implement it usually a lot, uh, faster to more effect than, than like technique where you've got to take sometimes, you know, months and months to get it right. Um, so yeah, I can really appreciate, uh, your book and really applaud you on it. Um, uh, so we'll definitely, like I said, link to the book in, uh, in our show notes page and uh, a couple more questions for you, uh, Bo. Um, one is always a fun question, uh, that I ask everybody is, uh, almost everybody is, uh, if you could write a message on a billboard that's, uh, put up in the most highly trafficked area of, uh, and if you listen to Tim Ferriss, you might have recognized this question, but you know, if you could write anything you want on that billboard, uh, in terms of like, helping people break through either in their tennis game or their life. Uh, what would you write on that billboard? Wow. What would I write on the billboard? Uh, man. Um, I would say maybe, I would say go towards your potential is what I would say. Mm. I think whatever way you want to take that, you know, I think that's, 
the ultimate is where we're all trying to get, you know, because it really, it doesn't really matter if you win this and that tournament uh, somewhat, you know, this tournament gets played next year and everybody forgets who won and who lost, you know, but if you think that that's where you could get to, then, then that's all that really matters for you. And I think it's a, it's a positive way to start your day. And, you know, I think it, it really helps me deal with sort of the monotony of just regular regular Wednesdays, even if you're coaching pros, I mean, there's still just regular practice days where it kind of feels like nothing, nothing game changing happened. But, you know, if if you're going towards the best version of you, you know, eventually you got to think that it'll click and and you'll get there, you know? And to me, that's, that's the ultimate goal that at least I have for myself. So I would probably say go towards your potential. I like that. Uh, You know, obviously we don't want to be at the end of our, lives hopefully that's a long time away where we're like oh man i wish i did xyz and you know i didn't take action yeah so uh so that's a really good yeah. one awesome man what did what did marcus willis say to that oh my god i gotta look back damn see that's the thing though i don't remember if i asked him that we're gonna have to look we're gonna have to look back oh, okay. at that but i get a lot of different answers you know it's like just have fun like some are like very like simple and others are more uh you know, intricate, but, uh, I mean, I, I like that one. That, that's really good. Um, what's, what's one that you remember? What's one that you remember? Uh, I think one that, let's see. I mean, off the top of my head, the one that, uh, I remember is like, be compassionate to yourself. Uh, kind of what we were talking about a little bit earlier. Um, so that was yeah. a really good one. Um, uh, but yeah, I'll have to put, I'll have to like write an article, I think on, on the website, uh, with a compilation of, of yeah. that. I think that would be a good one. I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, sweet. Cool. Uh, all right, let's see. Oh yeah. I, I do want to obviously get people to follow you on, on social media and also check out any other, like, I don't know, websites or, or anything. So where can people find you uh, online? Uh, my, my username is always Bo, B-E-A-U dot trays, T-R-E-Y-Z. So it's pretty simple. If you just search my name, uh, I should be there. And, uh, you know, I'm always on Instagram and, and things like that. So any messages and DMs, usually I see, I, I forgot, I saw yours and I forgot to respond, but usually I do uh, as, as much as I can. I mean, yeah. uh, I'm on it all the time, so I'll see it and, and I'll get to it for sure. Cool, man. Cool, cool. Awesome. And, and uh, where, uh, or actually, I mean, what what are your plans moving forward, like uh, in terms of, you know, tennis and everything else? Uh, right now I'm coaching Patrick Kipson, a young American guy. Um, so that that's my plan as of now, you know, help him get to his potential and, and reach his goals. Uh, so I'm with him full time. Uh, we're going to play a 25K in Naples next week. And then again, the following week. And then... Um, after that, it, we're just going to have to see, really. Um, maybe go to Europe and play uh, some futures and challengers, but it's, you know, with with COVID, everything mm-hmm. is, is kind of up in the air and getting canceled last minute or really tough quarantines. And, you know, so it's it's hard to say um, exactly where we'll be, but that's that's my uh, my priority right now, yeah. Awesome, man. Are you, are you staying up, like, all night watching these matches? <laughs> At the Australian? No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I'm not, not <laughs> actually. I I, yeah. I watch uh, I watch some in the mornings, um, or I'll catch some at the at the like in the middle of the day or something. But I'm I'm not. You know, I'm I'm so in tennis all the time that that to stay up and watch it would have to be a guy I really like. You know, yeah. but I'm 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 not. I gotta back off the tennis every now and then. You know, <laughs> are you watching them? I mean, I'm watching them, but I've been trying to uh, really nail down my my morning routine and and you know wake up earlier. So it's it's very difficult, yeah. you know, for me to to watch these matches and not wake up feeling like a pile of crap. So I, I yeah, you know sure. have not so far. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I've been enjoying some of it and just catching the highlights. Um, yeah, it's so. gonna be hard to watch now with no fans. I mean, like I, I didn't yeah. watch that much of the U.S. Open. I mean, I watch it and you know I take my notes and all that, but like. It's just different with no fans. You're not really, you're not in it. You know, you're to me, at least you're just watching strategy and I do that all day anyway. So I don't really want to watch it, but I mean, when the, I love, especially the Aussie, I feel like the Aussies are really fun. Like that curious <laughs> team match was awesome to watch. So, Crazy. um, yeah, it's tough without the fans, but yeah, it is. I mean, uh, I know, uh, Taylor Fritz was, um, was talking about that and how I guess they, they, pause for like 10 minutes or something to get the fans yeah. out because of the uh the deadline to do that so yeah that's wild i mean that's such a bummer in, in my opinion i think especially for somebody like taylor who has like 
I mean, he, I feel like he always plays best on a big stage yeah. and you, you put him against Novak in the fifth with a full stadium. I mean, maybe you just get a dip, maybe you get a different outcome there. Whereas if you put him alone with Novak, it, it can change just, it's the energy is completely different, you know? So that's, that's kind of a tough draw on his end, but you know, you gotta be safe. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was just, just so actually really awkward when, uh, I don't know if you saw the replays or what, when Novak yelled and it's just like dead silence Yeah, <laughs> at the end. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a tough look for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, anyways, uh, but yeah, but it was a pleasure uh, speaking with you. And again, I want everybody to, uh, check out, uh, Bo's book, how to tennis, think, train and compete to your potential. So we'll link that up. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll end with asking you this final question, which you've given us a lot of great tips today, but, uh, this question I definitely always ask, which is, uh, what is one key tip to help, uh, the audience improve their tennis games? Man, I would say play to the opponent's weaker side. Yeah. <laughs> simple, yeah. simple play to the backhand usually uh yeah i like to keep it simple that's that's game plan a b and c for me yeah that's a game changer and i i think people still you know <laughs> they don't do it they do other stuff but uh sweet man yeah. well uh yeah thanks a lot for coming on to the podcast uh you know hopefully we'll connect again in the future but you know best of luck with uh with patrick and with everything and uh yeah thanks for putting out some great content to the the tennis world so i really appreciate you and uh thanks for being on the podcast Hey, thanks for having me. This was a blast. Any, anytime. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. All right. I really hope you enjoyed my interview with Coach Bo Trays. Uh, I definitely recommend that you check out his book, How to Tennis, Think, Train, and Compete to Your Potential. And we will have the link to Bo's book and any of the other links that we mentioned on the show today on the show notes page, which is located in your app of choice. And you can also check it out at tennisfiles.com slash podcast, uh, which has a handy dandy audio player as well, containing all of the podcasts, easily searchable. You can type in mental, you can type in fitness, you can type in technique, whatever it is you want, and you will see the episodes that are pertinent. So that's really helpful. You know, if you're having a particular issue with a particular part of your game, then you can just search that term and you will most likely, I think with over 180 episodes, you will definitely see something on there. And if you don't, let me know. Send me an email at mirabon at tennisfiles.com and I will whip one up uh, when I can anyway. <laughs> and uh, speaking of the podcast, I would really appreciate it if you would leave a review for the podcast if you find value in the show and in the information that we present here. And you can do that at tennisfiles.com slash Apple Podcasts or on your favorite podcast app of choice. And uh, I just want to highlight a really kind review that I received lately, I think a couple of weeks ago, by Sabina, who I think we featured uh, on last year's Tennis Summit, Gigi Fernandez, uh, Analyze Your Volleys. So that was really fun. Uh, your volley technique, but Sabina said, love the discussion and topics. I have listened to this podcast for a long time and it's one of my favorite tennis podcasts. I love the focus on how to get better and the mix of sharing his own experience and interviewing coaches within every aspect of the game. Really incredible content Mirabon creates for our tennis community, including the yearly tennis summit. And I appreciate that a lot. Fun to listen to while learning and enjoying this wonderful sport. Double exclamation points. Thanks so much, Sabina. Super kind of you. Really appreciate that. And yes, I'm so excited about the Tennis Summit that is coming up on April 19th. So definitely, uh, if you're not subscribed to my newsletter, then just go to tennisfiles.com and do that. Uh, and you will get uh, notified as soon as registration goes up for that. Some of the... the, the uh, <laughs> stumbling my words, but I'm basically in the planning stages and figuring out exactly which coach is going to present on what topic. We'll have easily over 30 coaches, probably closer to 40. We'll see. And some really amazing names. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And I'd like to leave you with a quote, as I often like to do at the end of the show. And this one is by John Wooden. And Coach John, the legend, or Coach Wooden, the legendary coach, uh, said, 
make each day your masterpiece. And I really love that advice because it's really up to us to take the action or actions that we need to make it a great day. And, you know, it's it really just stems from from our thoughts, from the mind, and then most importantly, to take that action and take control. Don't let the day control you. You control the day. And uh, yeah, I remember Rick Macy, uh, amazing coach, said something to that effect uh, in playing a tennis match. You know, don't let the match control you. You control the match. So uh, I really appreciate that advice from Coach Wooden. All right. Well, with that, I uh, really appreciate you listening to this episode and to all the episodes that you have checked out. And I just hope you that hope that you got a lot of value from it. And really excited to keep bringing you uh, and serving you, uh, you know, these episodes to help you improve your tennis game and to get you where you want to be. So uh, with that, just uh, stay safe out there and play some tennis if you can. And wish you all the best. And this is Mirabhan Arachad signing out. Thank you.